In this video, we'll talk about direct map caches. These can be contrasted to associative caches, and when we talk about the general case later on, we'll see that the general case is a combination of both associative caching and direct map caching. With associative memories, there is an unfortunate design trade-off. We can either build the memory to be small, or we can uh, make it larger, but then it's slower. The fundamental problem is that all the lines in the associative memory have to be matching at once, so we have to broadcast uh, the key to all parts of the memory. And that uh, takes uh, more time and more power. So uh, associative memories are not practical at larger sizes. So there's another approach which is called direct map cache. And these caches do not use associative memory principles. So let's start by looking at an example of a direct map cache. We'll stick with our block size of 64 bytes. And in this cache, we'll have 512 lines. So if we multiply these together, we see that the cache size is 32 kilobytes. In a fully associative cache, any block can go into any cache line. Okay, it's associative. It doesn't matter where you put it. With a direct map cache, each block can only go into one particular cache line. So a given block, uh, for example, uh, block number 514, can only go into line 2. Okay, it can't be stored in any other line. And likewise, line 2 can only hold certain blocks it might hold block number 2, or it might hold block number 514, or it might hold block 1026, and there could be many other uh, possible blocks that could go into line 2. But each block in main memory can only be put into one particular line. For example, block 512 might go into line 0, block 513 might go into line 1, and block 514 can only go into line 2. So just as with a fully associative cache, each line still needs to contain information about which block is currently being stored in that line. But with a direct map cache, we now can avoid the associative lookup. If we are looking for a particular block, well, it can only be in one possible line, so there's only one place to look for it. All we have to do to retrieve a particular block is retrieve the line that it has to be stored in and then check to see whether that line really did in fact contain the right block. So we're going to look at a cache with 512 lines as an example and note that 2 to the 9th is 512. So we can address any line in the block with a 9-bit number. So here's how the direct map cache system works. First of all, let's look at our address. It's 32 bits. And as before, the last six bits will be used to choose the byte from within the block. Each block has 64 bytes, so it takes six bits to pick out the byte of interest. But here's where it differs. We're using these nine bits as an index and the remaining 17 bits are a tag. So the direct map cache will store not only the data for the block, but it will also store the tag. So each line has not only the 64 bytes here, but it also has 17 bits for the tag. There may be some other bits for valid and dirty and so on, but these aren't shown here. And so when the cache is presented with a 32-bit address, what does it do? It pulls off the six bits for the block uh, offset, and then it extracts the nine bits here and uses those as an index into a normal sort of memory. So this is a normal sort of memory where every line has its own address, and these sorts of memories are fast. This is just like a, a normal DRAM, except instead of uh, having only one byte, 
for each address, you've got a bunch of bits. You've got 64 bytes here and 17 additional bits here. But other than that, it's a, a typical sort of DRAM style memory. So the 9-bit index is used to select one particular line and then that line is retrieved and in the second step we match the tag from that line to the tag that we're looking for. And if they match, we know we've found the right block. If they match, we know that that block was in cache and so we're in luck and the cache can re return that data to the CPU. It can use the block offset to extract the appropriate byte and then send that byte back to the CPU. So to repeat how the direct map cache works, the cache receives an address from the CPU and from that 32-bit address it extracts the tag, the index, and the offset. And then the cache uses the index, in our example it's 9 bits, and it uses it as an address into the cache memory and it retrieves the entire line from the cache. Then the cache compares the tag bits, in our example it was 17 bits, and it compares that to the tag that was stored in the line that got retrieved. And if they are the same, then we know it is a cache hit. And if the tag is different, then we know it's a cache miss. And finally, if it's a cache hit, then in the final step, the individual byte or bytes from the block are extracted. So the cache uses the offset, the remaining six bits of the address, to determine which byte is wanted, and then it extracts that byte and returns that byte to the CPU. Let's continue with our example where we're using a cache that has 512 lines. So over on the right hand side I'm depicting main memory and every chunk of 64 bytes is a block of main memory and uh, you know so the idea is that there are 64 bytes here there's another 64 bytes here and then there are 64 bytes in each one of these um, chunks and memory all two gigabytes of it um, I'm sorry, all four gigabytes, it's, it's a 32-bit address, so we have four gigabytes of memory. All four gigabytes of memory is divided into uh, blocks. If a block is in cache, then, well, this is a direct map cache, so that block can only be stored in one particular line. Okay, so if the block is in the cache, it will be in a particular line. For example, if block three is in the cache, it will be in this line here. And so over here I've shown for each one of the lines of the cache which blocks might be stored in that line. At any one point in time the line can only contain one of those blocks. It can only contain 64 bytes and it will either contain one block or some other block. So the first line, which we call line 0, can contain this block. Line number one can contain block number one. Line number two can contain block number two. And so on, all the way up to 511. And then block 512 has to go back, has to go into line zero. So line zero can either store this block or this block or block 1024, which is down here below. And there are many, many blocks in our four gigabyte memory and so there are many many possible blocks that might be stored in line 0 but as you see each block can only go into one line and um, it, that tells you exactly where to look for it so for example if we're looking for block 514 we look uh, in line number 2 and it's either there or it's not so that's what the tag bits are for now what can go wrong with this system well, notice that this particular line, line number two, can either contain block number two or 
block number 514 or block 1026 and so on. So block 2 and block 514 happen to be mapping to the same line. If they are in the cache then they will be in this particular line. So only one of these blocks can be in memory at the very same time. Okay, uh, Blocks 2 and and 514 must be placed into the same cache line. Now, here's the problem. What if our working set happens to contain bytes in both blocks? Let's say it contains a byte here, down at the bottom of block 2, and maybe the working set also contains some bytes at the beginning of block 514. It's not too likely, but it's possible that uh, when we're executing a particular section of the program we need information from block 2 and we need information from block 514. This is a conflict. We can only get one of these blocks into the cache. So if our program is executing and it wants to use this byte then it will load this block into the cache and then uh, very soon thereafter it might need this byte. So it evicts block 2 and moves block 514 into the same spot. And then it accesses this. And then perhaps it needs to go back and access this byte again. Well, it'll have to evict 514 and move block 2 back into the cache. So you can see what's going on. It can't keep both these blocks in the cache at once. And if both blocks contain data that's part of the working set, we've got a problem. And that problem is called thrashing. So in this particular example, there's a conflict and the cache thrashes. And this is not too likely, but it, it can really occur. And when it does occur, it's going to just really perfect performance in a very negative way. So we, we can't really uh, tolerate cache thrashing. And so this is why direct mapped caches by themselves, as I've described them, aren't quite adequate. But it's a starting point and we'll move on to uh, the general case in just a second and see how we can solve that problem. But before we move on, let's look at what's going on here in a little bit more detail. The 32-bit address is broken up into 17 bits of the tag, 9 bits of the index, and then 6 bits to select the byte within the block. And in all these addresses here, the index is 2. Binary 1, 0 is equal to 2. So all of these addresses will map into line 2 of the cache. We don't really care what the offset uh, bits are because those are um, whatever they are. All addresses that start with these 17 and 9 bits, in other words that start with these 26 bits, any address that starts with these 26 bits will map into um, line 2 of the cache. And so th these are coming out of the second block in main memory. Okay? 1, 0 is 2. And as we change the tag values, uh, if you look at this in binary, the number 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 is 514. And this number 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 is 10,026 and so on. So you can see that the high order 26 bits give the block number. Okay, And so all of these blocks, block 2, block 514, block 1026, all map into line 2 of the cache. So any byte that has an address of, the, the, of any of these forms will go into cache line number 2.